Homo sapiens appeared about 200,000 years ago, and finally, we made our first appearance on the family tree. Our brain had grown the largest of all surviving humans. It wasn't just acquiring a large brain which allowed us to survive. Another species had an equally large brain, the Neanderthals. They appeared about 300,000 years ago. Their brain size was exactly the same as ours. In body height, they were also about the same but slightly more robust. Neanderthals migrated to Europe in the middle of the Ice Age. They were a hardy race as well as being good hunters. But they are now gone from the miracle planet. And we remain. From archaeological evidence, it seems that both Neanderthal and Homo sapiens shared very similar abilities. In this part of southwestern France, there are many Neanderthal sites. The Réjour du prehistoric site was discovered by chance while the landowner was digging in his garden. There are Neanderthal remains here from 70,000 years ago. Dr. Jean-Michel Genest has researched this site. He knows that the Neanderthals had the technical ability to make and use tools. Les données que nous avons sur l'outillage de l'homme dans Néertal montrent qu'il y avait à la fois des outils qui étaient très spécialisés et qui ne servaient qu'à racler la peau, et qu'à côté de cela, ils avaient des outils un petit peu à tout faire, selon les, les moments, et qui servaient à couper les tendons, à faire de la boucherie, aussi à racler les peaux, et pourquoi pas aussi à tailler un bâton pour faire un épieu. Donc il avait une gamme d'outils très adaptée à ses besoins. They hunted the large bison that roamed Europe during the Ice Age. Their sites are found all across the continent. Their population may have reached half a million. Everything seemed set for success. Dr. Genest even believes that they were capable of thoughts similar to ours. The skeleton of this Neanderthal is exactly as it was found perhaps evidence that they had thoughts of some afterlife and buried their dead. Mais ce qui va demeurer la grande particularité de l'homo sapiens sapiens, c'est pas tant au niveau des techniques, il va développer des associations très complexes d'objets entre elles. C'est qu'il va développer des systèmes techniques, mais que dans le même temps, il aura aussi développé une une culture dans laquelle il y aura une place particulière pour les images, pour la représentation figurative ou schématique. Et cela, on ne le connaît pas chez l'homme de Neanderthal. The two different species of humans seemed so similar. But what gave us the edge? There's an intriguing theory that might provide an answer. Dr. Jeffrey Leitman of New York's Mount Sinai School of Medicine compared the two skulls and then noticed a minor difference in the shape. Find groups like Neanderthals. And when you study the bottom of skull knee, it was at the base of the skull. With Neanderthals, the central part of the base is flat, but in the modern human skull, it is rounded. The difference corresponded to the upper side of the throat, where the larynx or voice box is situated. As well as studying human skulls, he also studied living apes, 
They too had flat central bases in their skulls, just like the Neanderthal. Strangely, there is still a trace of Neanderthal in all of us, but it doesn't last very long. Remarkably, baby humans have the same configuration. So if you look at a newborn baby, its voice box is also all the way up in the throat, and babies always breathe through the nose and have the ability to breathe and swallow almost at the same time. Something remarkable happens in human development. Our voice box starts a journey down into the neck, unlike any other mammal. We start in one place, but we end up in another. And that journey is very dangerous because it changes our entire neuromuscular coordination system. The changes begin in the early year of life and continue as we grow. As we get older, because we have a larynx all the way down in the throat, our airway and our foodway, which were separate in babies and which were separate in a monkey or a dog, are now crossed. And this is very dangerous. And this is one of the reasons we always get food stuck in our throat <coughs> when we're trying to eat. And it's also one of the reasons why we have food that regurgitates. So we've lost out, but we gain something. By the larynx going all the way down in the throat, we get a large area of space above it, which can take the sounds that are produced inside the larynx at what we call the vocal cords or vocal folds, and we can modify them to a greater extent than that possible for any other mammal. We have thus gained the ability for fully articulate speech. The two species had their larynx at different levels. The Neanderthal is on the left, modern humans on the right. The flatness of their skull base tells us their larynx would be up much higher and that their overall vocal tract would be very different than that which you find in living human beings. This tells us that Neanderthals could not speak the way we speak today. When the larynx is in a high position, the distance from the mouth to the vocal tract is short. We let our voices resonate in the vocal tract. With a short vocal tract, Neanderthals would be limited. The general ambience would be different. According to some linguists, they probably couldn't make certain of what we call the quantal vowel sounds, the ones we call in English oo, a, e, the sounds in boot, father, or feet. It's highly unlikely that Neanderthals could make them uh, and with the same speed that we do. The hallmark of our kind is our ability to have fully articulate speech. This is what sets us apart from all other animals, and this is what set us apart from Neanderthals. Modern science now has the technology to investigate down to the molecular level. Dr. Simon Fisher and Cecilia Lai of the Wellcome Trust Center in England have identified a gene that is involved with speech. It's called FOXP2 and is attached to the human chromosome number seven. They think this gene evolved more recently than 200,000 years, which would suggest that FOXP2 appeared after we had evolved. It might have improved brain functions that are used for language skills but we don't know as yet. We think that FOXP2 is a very exciting discovery um, because it clearly has had a dramatic impact on um, human speech and language abilities, but it's important to realise that this is just one piece of a bigger puzzle. Um, uh, but the great thing is that we now have a tool we can use FOXP2 to find other elements of the pathway and of the puzzle. 40,000 years ago, Europe was experiencing the last peak of an ice age. In the north, the glaciers expanded and covered that part of the continent. 
In those conditions, perhaps it was language skills which gave us the edge over the Neanderthals. We would have been able to share information about the large migrating herds so we could plan ahead for the hunts and would be able to record the information we had gathered. It's thought that the marks on this bone might be a calendar of sorts. It was made by modern humans 35,000 years ago. We had started on a path that no other species had followed. These paintings on the walls of a cave in France show our ability to picture the world around us. We not only spoke a complex language, we began to transmit knowledge to future generations. The essential difference between the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons appears to have been one of symbolic ability. The Neanderthals left behind themselves a very rich record of their material lives, but that record doesn't really contain much, if anything at all, that suggests a symbolic kind of existence. Whereas the lives of the Cro-Magnons were literally drenched in symbol. The Cro-Magnons were us. They had all of those characteristics that we prize in, in ourselves today. Um, they had painting. They painted fantastic art on the walls of caves. They did sculpture. They did engraving. They had music. They had musical instruments. Uh, they had notation. They had symbolic behaviors of all of the kinds that we associate with ourselves today. Indeed, we have come a long way from those fires our distant ancestors lit in the African night. Dr. Ian Tattersall of the American Museum of Natural History believes it was complex language that allowed the development of symbolic thought, the communication of ideas and beliefs. Language is more or less nowadays uh, inextricable from our symbolic mental processes that allow us to understand the world in unprecedented uh, ways and ask questions like, you know, what if? We can pose questions like that and experiment with ways of dealing with the world and of exploiting the world in a more efficient way. And that is what I think sort of made uh, Homo sapiens a unbeatable competitor when they came on the scene and what ultimately led to the demise of the Neanderthals. 30,000 years ago, the fate of the two human species, Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, came to a crossroads. Complex verbal communication allowed Homo sapiens to share thoughts and ideas, to cooperate in the search for food and the struggle for existence. It was a struggle that the Neanderthals would lose, and there would be only one species left on the Miracle Planet. In a rural area in southwestern France lies one of the last Neanderthal sites. Immediately above the Neanderthal remains are those of Homo sapiens. Perhaps Neanderthals were driven away from their former habitat by the more capable modern humans. Or perhaps the Neanderthals quietly left on their own. Whatever, 30,000 years ago, they died out. We became the last survivors. For the past four billion years, the pace seems to have picked up. Perhaps our mastery of language is taking us toward a new and faster process of evolution. I think it is a fascinating point that language is a kind of second genetics. Genetics itself lasted for the first four billion years of life's history, and then quite suddenly, Darwinian evolution, genetic evolution, gave rise to creatures with big brains which developed a second kind of genetics, which is language and the transmission of linguistic information down through generations. That gave rise to a second kind of evolution, which is called cultural evolution, 
which looks like genetic evolution in a superficial sense, but it's enormously faster. And our lives have become faster. We live in an age when technology moves at a pace that perhaps we cannot stop. Our ability to communicate has at times transcended the message we are trying to send. What took decades now can be achieved in less than a year. And as each year passes, the pace increases. As a species, we now can influence the climate, just as microbes did in the early history of the Earth. We must learn the history of our planet, which has nurtured life for billions of years. Dr. Noam Chomsky knows that the choice for the future is ultimately ours. Now, this is a question of history, not evolution. Uh, and it's a question of culture and uh, intelligence and uh, sympathy and under mutual understanding and mutual aid and support and so on. Those are capacities that we have. Uh, we know from our own history and experience that those capacities can be overwhelmed by other more destructive, uh, savage, and uh, uh, cruel capacities that we also have. And the balance of these will determine uh, whether the species survives in any decent form. And that's a matter of will and choice. There are no natural laws about this. As a species, we are still held captive by the only planet we know that can support life. Science shows us that life was nurtured in the oceans of this planet soon after its birth, and that it matured through long ages of change. Finally, it spread out across the world diversified into myriad forms, most of which would fade away to become only a memory. After millions of years, a single species was to be the pervading force, but that could change in the blink of an eye. If we have learnt anything at all from our history, it must be that in the end, life prevails, and ultimately, will be the victor on the miracle planet.